now. Did you click it? All right. So hello and welcome to the Addicts Anonymous podcast. I'm your host, Jim R. Today is episode 37 and we have a special guest I'm excited to have. Noah Levine. He's actually got a few books out. I know I read Dharma Punks and I read Refuge Recovery during my recovery. So I was explaining to you, I'm a little excited and nervous at the same time today. So how are you doing today, my friend? Thanks, Jim. I'm doing great. Happy to be here and look forward to our discussion. All right, cool. So let's start a little bit about your childhood. Um, you know, I was born in 71 in California. Uh, you know, my dad was into meditation before I was born, and he also had a history of addiction before I was born. And, you know, they were like hippie, you know, I was born in Humboldt, you know, up in the weed growing capital. And, um, and my parents didn't stay married. They got divorced when I was two. And, you know, my father is this like cool spiritual Stephen Levine has written all these great books and, um, you know, his meditator. So like meditation was modeled for me. My mom was struggling with addiction. She got remarried, divorced again. She had four kids. I'm a middle kid, you know? So my childhood was, I felt like a little lost in the middle and, uh, you know, but, the, and I was suffering, you know, like I was, um, by the time I was five years old, I was feeling suicidal. I was feeling like, I don't want to exist. And because my dad was into Buddhism and Hinduism and new age philosophy, he taught me about reincarnation. So I was like, I'll just kill myself and start over, you wow, know, so, not death also, as the end, but death as like, oh, you, you get a new family. That's like a, that's a complicated thought for such a young mind, I, I guess, because that, that takes, that's deep, I guess is the word for that. That's well, deep. It is on some level, but also like uh, later when I was reflecting on how crazy it is to be suicidal at such a young age, but like cartoons, like all the cartoons I grew up with, um, you know, the road runner or Daffy Duck or whatever, they're all so violent when you look at yeah. it. They're always mur like the road runner, you know, like uh, Wiley Coyote is getting killed every episode, yeah. but he's always there the next episode. He falls off the cliff, he's dead, but he's then he continues to exist. Yep. And so like in my childhood psyche, I was like, oh, well, that's what reincarnation's like. Right? Like you get killed and then you, you know, you start over. Yeah. <laughs> Just show back so, up like Wally Coyote. That's pretty funny. That's pretty, it's another interesting thing that you compare that. For some reason, that's how it worked in my mind. Um, so I didn't, you know, my, uh, I didn't kill myself. Obviously I'm still here. I'm 51 years old and, um, I started getting loaded by the time I was seven. I started drinking my mom's wine and smoking oh, my dad's weed. Uh, by 10 years old, I was taking their, their mushrooms and their LSD. And I'm assuming they didn't know, that, or did they know that you were they taking didn't, they, No, they, they, well, they didn't really know. By the time I was like 11 and 12, they knew because they were like, you're stealing our shit. And by the time I was 12, they were like, okay, you get high. It's okay. Get high in the house. We, you know, that hippie parenting kind of like, yeah, yeah. So all through my teen years, you know, like, um, you know, and, and then I went from the hallucinogens and the booze and the weed to cocaine and heroin and smoking crack. And so I got what age so, was this? so the, strung out and the coke and the crack. What age was that? I mean, I was smoking cocaine when I was 13 and, you know, really strung out on crack. Like when I was 15, 16, 17, I was really strung out. Um, I, I got introduced to recovery at 13 years old, court ordered, go to get your court card signed because I was getting arrested a lot. And, you know, so I know you asked about childhood and, you know. Um, so my childhood was crazy on a lot of levels and on a lot of levels, like I didn't have much of a childhood. You know, like I was a kid, but I was pretty like I had this internalized feeling of like, I can't rely on anybody. I got to take care of my own shit. And my parents aren't, you know, my mom's struggling with addiction. My dad's, you know, busy being spiritual, whatever the fuck he's doing. <laughs> um, so I felt like my childhood ended, you know, pre way prematurely. Like, your dad you know, when I was a teenager strung out, I didn't feel like a, 
kid. I felt like, you know, like I was an adult, you know, doing adult things, adult crimes and starting to get consequences, starting to get locked up. I was in and out of juvenile hall from the age of 12. Your dad was a hippy dippy type of guy. At what age, it was around five years old that he introduced you to meditation stuff. Did he ever try and get you in? Did he ever push you towards that? Not really. No, he, you know, like I, I grew up with it. So it wasn't like he introduced me to it. I just, it was modeled. It was what he did. We were, you know, we'd go to meditation centers, spiritual things. I'd see them meditating. I know that he wrote, I knew that he wrote books about it, that he taught it. So it was modeled, but he wasn't like, hey, this is what you should do. He was just kind of like, it's what I do. And if, you know, if you get interested, he didn't push it. He, he never sent me to like some kind of Buddhist Sunday school or anything like that. Buddhist Sunday school. So tell us a little bit as you grew up, what was the first time, when was the first time you yourself, without someone pushing you towards it, said, I need help. I'm an addict. But the I think probably around 16, 16, 17, when I was really strung out on crack and drinking alcoholically and had that sort of repetitive shame and regret and um, like that, that breaking the crack pipe and I'm not going to smoke crack anymore. And, you know, doing that kind of thing, being like, I fucking need help. Like I'm an addict and I don't know how to stop. And around that time, I actually, some of my older friends were going to get, you know, going to treatment, going to, um, at one point I even called some treatment centers and was like, I'm, you know, I need help. And I was like on my own on the streets, emancipated, you know, dropped out of school, was not like, I wasn't like a high school kid. I was a street kid. So you were living and, on the streets? Yeah. I mean, I, I had a like, I could crash at my mom's couch. But at, at uh, when I turned 16, I left, New, my father was in New Mexico and I got emancipated and I left. And I was like, I went and I got a job and I dropped out of school. And, um, but I never got my shit together enough to like actually have an apartment. So I was like staying at squats. I was, you know, staying at, you know, couch surfing, staying at my mom's, you know, kind of crashing, crashing my little brother's bunk bed, you know? So I wasn't totally homeless, but I didn't really have a home. You were bouncing around. I got you. Yeah, there was yeah, no, yeah. there was no solid place that you called it. You called it home. Yeah. I mean, I could stay at my mom's, but I didn't want to, I was kind of like, no, no, like uh, I'm free. But then the reality is I didn't have my shit together enough to be free. How was this affecting your parents? Were they going nuts because of you? Were they, did you break no, their hearts? No, my mom was, you know, she would pick me up when I got arrested. And so she was concerned, but she was really strung out at the time. So she wasn't, you know, she wasn't, she cared and would show up and be present as much as she could, but she was a mess. Um, and my father was a little bit kind of like um, standoffish. He was like, you want to be a man? Go be a man and take the consequences. So they weren't, you know, at the end, you know, when I was locked up and looking at my third felony and, you know, really strung out and my father was like on, he didn't even show up to the juvenile hall. He like called me and was like, you want to try meditation? And I was oh, like, I read oh, this, yeah, yeah, I'll, I read I'll this try. in your book. Yeah, where I yeah. believe, if I'm not mistaken, weren't you in a padded room at the time or something? Yeah, I had had a tell us about had, that. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, the end for me was, um, you know, getting locked up for the umpteenth time and and, uh, you know, feeling so despondent that I was like suicidal and felt like I might as well just end it because I can't stop and I can't live. And I don't want to be locked up for the rest of my life. And that's what it's looking like it's going to. Um, so I had a, like a suicide attempt in a holding cell. And so then they put me into a padded room observation, you know, kind of. And that was when I got the, you know, call from my father. And, and I said, I'm, I need help. You know, like you were saying, like, I, uh, I don't think I'd ever asked him for help in that way before. And I said, I need help. I I know I'm an addict and I'm suffering so much. And, and he said, well, let me teach you mindfulness. Let me give you some meditation instructions. 
And um, I was desperate enough and willing enough to be like, I'll try it. I'll try anything. And that was the beginning, you know, of my recovery and of my meditation practice that's been so central in my experience of recovery. And that was in 1988. Quite some time ago. So I know um, talking a little bit about what I've read about you, it seems like you went around the world at one point looking at different meditation centers and kind of bouncing from one to the next. Tell us a little bit about your travels. I got clean. This, this took got, place after, did this, uh, sorry to interrupt, did it take place after the rehab incident where your dad spoke with you or was it all the traveling yeah, before? Yeah, no, all after, you know, I got, I got sober in 1988 when I was 17 years old. So then I was ended up being in a group home until I turned 18 and then, you know, go into junior college and, you know, go into 12 step and, you know, doing meditation and, um, and then it was in my early 20s that, that uh, at about two years sober, I was still lying and stealing and cheating. And in my early recovery, I thought, you know, it's to the drugs that are the problem. If I could just stop doing the drugs, maybe there's, I, I felt like there was a, you know, in 12-step, they say spiritual solution. But I was pretty convinced that there was a material solution. If I got the right motorcycle and the right car and the right girlfriend and the right you know, pair of boots and leather jacket or whatever, you know, like yeah, that I'd be no. happy, right? Yeah. And if I got the stuff. And then I found myself a couple years in and I had most of the stuff. I'd stolen a bunch of it. I'd, you know, like, but I had it and I was still miserable. And all of that self centered, self hatred, craving, you know, was still, I was abstinent. I was, you know, sober, but I wasn't healing. I wasn't recovering. And that really turned me to, okay, meditation is the only place that I'm getting any hope. The 12 steps, they're Judeo-Christian theistic, you know, um, perspective. I was just like, this is, this doesn't make sense to me. God, this make-believe God is going to restore me to sanity. Yeah. Like, a lot of people are, that's that. what you guys are selling. How is yeah. this is this is crazy? People actually believe this shit that there's some sort of God that's gonna you know like go in there and intervene in your cravings, and so it just didn't make sense to me at all. But meditation did, and the community in Twelve Steps was so good, you know, like the the other cool alcoholic addict people like me. So I love the people. But the philosophy was just like, this is, uh, doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. And of course, later I came to see, well, there's a lot of principles there that are good. The service, the generosity, the making amends, the, be, you know, like there's some good principles there, but that core Christian ideology, I just couldn't get my mind around. So I dove deeper into, and I'm leading up to the travels. I dove deeper into meditation. I started going to meditation retreats. I started meditating every day. And, and my kind of, I got, I got more hope of like, okay, there's a spiritual solution, but my spiritual solution is not theistic. It's not from the God of Abraham, Judeo-Christian, Islamic, monotheism, higher power as you understand him. Yeah. No, but Buddhism offers this non-theistic, humanist, psychological approach to training our own minds. And I was like, this shit actually is rational. It's spiritual, but it's about developing wisdom and compassion. And it makes sense to me that it's something that I can do through my own effort. And so I went all in. I was like, Buddhism, this makes sense. You know, I read the Bible. I read the Quran. I, you know, I did the spiritual shopping network, you know, kind of like in yep. AA, they said, you know, be quick to see where spiritual people are right and religious people are right. So I was like, well, I've got a lot of contempt prior to investigation. So let me investigate. Yeah. So I investigated the, you know, what the Christians believe, what the Jews believe, what the Muslims believe, what the Hindus believe, what the Buddhists believe. And then kind of checking out, well, what do I, what makes sense? What resonates? And what resonated most with me is Buddhism as a, maybe the only non-theistic path to spiritual awakening. 
doesn't ask for any faith, doesn't ask for any, you know, belief in, you know, supernatural, just psychological, emotional skill building through our own effort. That's a great way to so, put it. So that was like, for me, that was a game changer. So I kept doing AA, practicing Buddhism, going on meditation retreats. And then at some point I was like, okay, I need to go to the roots. You know, like when I got into music, I always want to track back the music, right? Like uh, I got into punk rock. What was the roots of punk rock? I got into hip hop. What's the roots of hip hop? Uh, reggae. I want to listen to the early Northern soul, 60s, funky reggae, you know, yeah. like. And so when I got into Buddhism, I was like, okay, I've got all these like Western teachers and the Dalai Lama's cool and Thich Nhat Hanh is cool. And, you know, um, but where's the roots? And so, you know, studying and being like, okay, it's India. It's, you know, Theravada in the old school tradition, yep. Thailand, Burma. So when I was about 25, I was like, I got to go on pilgrimage. I got to go to Thailand and, and check out the lineage. I got to go to India and see the, uh, you know, place where the Buddha was enlightened and, you know, check out the roots of this spiritual tradition that's so inspiring to me. So I went to Burma, I went to Sri Lanka, I went to Thailand in my 20s, you know, two or three times. Um, and, you know, and took months and, you know, saved up all my money and went and traveled and stayed in monasteries and had this whole spiritual adventure, you know, thinking that I was a pilgrim, but really I was just an American tourist. <laughs> it was, it was awesome. But yeah. So, um, what do you think, like, if you look back, what were you looking for on this ship? You said the roots, but once you happen, if say you found the roots of it, what was it you were looking to get out of it? Well, I mean, ultimately I was, you know, was then and continue to now is like looking for enlightenment looking for liberation, looking for freedom. When I was in my 20s, I had this immature, delusional perspective that like, it's gonna be easier over there. That there's, you know, that I'm gonna meet like this amazing teacher and it's gonna be easier. The reality is, whether you're in Thailand or, you know, Jersey, <laughs> you got the same mind. Yep. And, you know, it's about training the mind and whether you're in, you know, uh, Los Angeles or in at the Bodh Gaya, the Bodhi tree, it wasn't any easier over there. If anything, it's fucking more difficult because of all of the hardships of travel and poverty and foreign countries. And um, but, it, you know, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot just from traveling and learned a lot about myself. And and, you know, I went seeking liberation and realize that liberation is right here. It's not out there. There is no external place that is a refuge. The only refuge is our own heart and mind. And so, you know, learning that and still being like, hey, I still go to Thailand regularly to study and practice. It's awesome, I love it, but it's not a refuge. It's not the, the solution. The solution is all in here. And we take this with us wherever we go. So traveling's not necessary, but it's can be fun and inspiring. Yeah. So how throughout your life were relationships as far as with like other family members and also, you know, maybe personal romantic relationships, things like that? How were they affected? Um, you know, I got sober so young that I didn't have a lot of uh, relationships, you know, intimate relationships nothing serious before I got sober. Um, once I got sober, you know, my, my relationship with my family shifted a lot, you know, cause I still had active addiction. You know, my siblings were in active addiction. My mom was struggling. My father had been, you know, mostly clean. He was, he, he had like, my father had been like a, a junkie that then had the like marijuana solution where he just like smoked weed and, you know, didn't do drugs, you know, hard drugs anymore. Psychedelics and weed were his thing. Okay. Um, so, but my relationship, all of a sudden, I'm like the only sober one in my family. And so that was, you know, an interesting thing. And, but also like, I became a student of my father. So that relationship, you know, became like, oh, this is my, you know, like this guy knows what he's talking about. And, you know, kind of looking up to him as this spiritual teacher father. So that created an interesting dynamic of like dad as Dharma teacher. 
Okay. Um, and I and he was quick to say, "Hey, go study with these other teachers," and introduced me to a bunch of cool teachers. And um, romantically, mostly in my twenties and thirties, a uh, series of like short, you know, what, what do they call like serial monogamy? You know, these. Like, <laughs> I've short, never heard of that. You know, that's these kind of like, you know, falling for someone, being you know in a relationship, and then you know, six months later it ending and then jumping into the next one. And then, you know, for a few okay. months or whatever, but nothing really long-term until my thirties, I fell in love, got married, had children. Um, that relationship lasted for nine years. Uh, I married a woman who wasn't in recovery, wasn't an addict, um, wasn't a meditator and, you know, ended up good for a few years and then not so good and ended and, um, you know, and currently I'm in a relationship for almost two years now living together with a woman who is a meditator, who is a recovery person. And it's nice to have that in common, to have that yeah. foundation that we can both relate to. I was going to ask about your personal opinion, because you hear a lot, Yeah, don't get involved with a fellow addict. So what's your opinion on that? I, I kind of feel the way you do, where it's going to be hard to get someone that understands you unless they've been through it. Yeah, so it's yeah. like a good thing, but also you don't want to encourage each other to do bad things. Like if one falls, you don't want the other one to come right behind you. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I pros and cons, you know, on both, you know, pros and cons to uh, there's something wonderful about having that in common and being able to relate and go to meetings and meditate together and do the thing. It's, it's nice to, to have that, um, to be in with, you know, uh, and then there's the risk that you're pointing out. If you're in a relationship with somebody who might relapse, you know, or if you might relapse, then, you know, that's not, you know, the foundation of like, oh shit, what do we do if one of us relapses? Do we stay together and help each other? Do, you know, does that mean the relationship is over? You know, so there's a, there's a risk there. And then the other side of, you know, being in a relationship with somebody who's not an addict and doesn't understand the addict mind you know, there's a, can be a disconnect or a, uh, and, and maybe somebody who's not an addict. So then doesn't have the spiritual life that we need to have and have. This is and true. Maybe can't, re can't relate on that level. So I, I don't have a, like, I, I don't think that we should give each other too much advice on who you should and shouldn't be in relationship with. Um, people have to find their own way. Sounds good. So Tell us a little bit about Refuge Recovery. How did that start? Um, where did the idea for the book come from? Because, you know, people don't realize it's hard to do that stuff. Now that I'm trying myself, you realize it's not an easy thing to do. You know, I spent... Refuge Recovery came about around, you know, 12 years ago, something like that. Uh, 12, 15 years ago. So I'm 33 years sober. So I was, you know, I was like 15 years sober and I was living this life of Buddhism is my spiritual path. 12 step is my recovery community. And in 12 step, I have to translate all of this theistic language into my own Buddhist non-theistic understanding. And as I became a meditation teacher and um, Dharma punks and against the stream and became a, a big thing with thousands of students around the, you know, doing retreats and, and so many students were coming to me and saying, I want to use Buddhism for my recovery like you have. And in the beginning, I had to say like, hey, I still go to 12 step <laughs> because I, you know, because we need more than just a meditation practice. We need the support and, and connection of other addicts meeting with each other. How did it grow so fast to go right into like, you know, the thousands it just picked up and caught my, on? My meditation stuff? Yeah. Um, you know, because my books were popular. You know, Dharma okay. Punks was successful book. It, it inspired, you know, it, it was a best-selling book. And so it inspired, you know, thousands and thousands of people. And then they started to come and, you know, I was in New York teaching. I was in San Francisco. I was in L.A., and so the communities just grew. I was doing meditation retreats up at Kripalu up in Massachusetts. And um, what's that place in Rhinebeck, the Omega Institute. You know, I was, okay. on, tu I was on tour 
right? And yeah. so everybody was like, okay, cool, Dharma punks. Okay, cool, against the stream. Oh, this is about recovery. And half of the community was in recovery addicts and half were just like people who are seeking wisdom, you know, and yeah. weren't yeah. even addicts. But the addicts kept saying, we need a Buddhist approach to recovery. We're doing it in against the stream. We're doing it in Dharma punks. But, um, and I was like, well, okay, I'll create one because um, I get it. I get the pain in the ass of being in 12 step and having to translate everything. And actually I like Buddhism better, you know, and there's a perfect model here. The four noble truths, the eightfold path, the Buddha's core teachings for the end of suffering, AKA the end of addiction. Yeah. that we can recover based on these four noble truths, this eightfold path. So it's all late. I don't have to make anything up. The Buddha taught it 2,600 years ago. All yeah. I got to do is create a model of peer-led meetings, of teacher-led retreats, um, a few things that I had to tweak a little bit to apply to addiction recovery, but mostly it's just basic Buddhism. Okay. Um, so it came out, you know, it came out of that and I, in my meditation centers in Los Angeles, we started these kind of Buddhist recovery groups. And then the term refuge recovery, you know, something that I made up a little bit later. Uh, the book came out about eight years ago now, uh, 2014, I guess. Going on, is that seven or eight years? Going eight, this summer is eight years, I think. Um, and then when the book came out, also because I already had a platform, right? I already had three books. Dharma exactly. Punks, Against the Restream, and uh, Heart of the Revolution. I had meditation centers in New York and Seattle and Boston and uh, uh, Los Angeles. I had two uh, Dharma Punks groups all over the country, right? So I'd already been doing it for 15 years when Refuge Recovery came out. So I already had this network. And so when that book came out, all of a sudden there was 100 Refuge Recovery meetings. Then there was 200. Then there was 800 refuge recovery wow. meetings within like within like four years that's amazing yeah that's amazing. um and you know because because of the kind of work that i'd done previously you know the platform that i was able to to to, to create it that way um and so you know refuge recovery is the first truth addiction uh is suffering creates suffering you know, and this is the Buddha's first noble truth that suffering is the norm, right? Everyone has some suffering. Yep. Addiction is a special kind of suffering that we experience. A more extreme level of suffering than the ordinary non-addict who is also suffering, but not like us addicts. It's a different, different level. The second truth, the cause of uh, addiction is repetitive craving. And Again, this is the Buddha's second noble truth. The cause of all of our suffering is this human survival instinct of repetitively craving pleasant experience and clinging to it, getting attached, getting addicted, or aversive to unpleasant, trying to avoid control, manipulate our experience. This causes all of our suffering. Third noble truth, the Buddha's teaching, enlightenment is possible. Freedom from suffering is an option, is something that we can attain. So for recovery, recovery is possible. We can establish abstinence, we can maintain abstinence, and through the eightfold path of meditation and ethical behavior and wisdom, we can heal the underlying causes and conditions that led to our addiction in the first place. We can take the action to heal, not divine intervention, not higher powers, not, you know, powerlessness, none of that. Powerful human action to train our mind and our heart to become compassionate towards our pain rather than aversive to it, to become non-attached to pleasure rather than addicted to it. And you know, people love it, right? Because, you know, we talk about it, it's like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. That makes, way, that makes way more sense than, 
you know, some sort of mystical, magical uh, solution. Human action to intervene with our own minds. You know, because that's all of our addiction is in our, there's some physical, you know, we can become physically dependent, but it's mostly the mind that is telling you what to do and you're obeying it. And that's why I like Buddhism, because to me, the Buddha, he was kind of like the world's first psychologist. Like he figured out all this stuff on training the brain and how the brain works and about suffering and craving, you know. Like to me, that's what it seems like he was the world's first. What do you think about that? Is that a good way of putting it? I like it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it's fucking neuroscience. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. I've read the what is it? The uh, the joy of living, I think. And the first half of the book is just basically psychology and, and how your neurons fired, how they work and the synapses and all these little things um, that just teach you that there is neuroplasticity is changing of the brain. And, you know, it's something that we're all capable of. So you were talking about your, what can we expect at a meeting? Once you actually go there, what is the process? Because I, I read a little bit about it, but I'd like you to tell me. So refuge, you know, one of the things that I didn't love about 12 step. Now, let me say, say this to you and your audience. I still go to 12 step. I'm 33 years sober. I still go. I never stopped going. I'm a little bit of a hater, but I'm a member that's a little bit of a hater. <laughs> Got you. I'm not one Got of those you. people that just like criticizes. I still go. It's an important part of my life. But one of the things that I've never liked about the 12 step you know, meeting model is like just getting together and talking about it. And, you know, the 11th step of like, you should meditate, but nobody really does. Yeah. So when I created refuge, I said, we need to meditate. We need to practice this in every meeting so that we're not just talking about it, we're doing it. And so a refuge recovery meeting is a 20 minute guided meditation that we all do together and that anybody can lead. I created meditation scripts. So I just hand you the script and I say, okay, Jim, you're leading the meditation today and okay. you read it and you say, okay, gently you know, close your eyes and bring your attention to your breath. And when your mind wanders, bring your attention back to your breath and bring some loving, you know, so you just read the script and we guide each other in a peer led meeting. And does that and rotate after, every week? Like every, say it was a weekly meeting, does somebody the next week do it differently? Or, or is there like a meeting leader or something like? No leaders. That's that we have to get rid of the fucking leaders. Yeah. That was absolutely <laughs> I, I had correct. to get rid of myself. You know, it's like, okay, I'm a Dharma teacher. But how the fuck am I going to have you have a meeting in Jersey? You don't have a Dharma teacher. And, yeah. you know, the last thing you want is some alcoholic pretending that they're a Dharma teacher. <laughs> so rotating leadership, you know, secretary who, you know, picks like so if you're the secretary, you say, hey, um, so and so, you know, Julie, will you lead the meditation today? And then next week, hey, you know, Fred, will you lead the meditation today? And so that it rotates around and you don't have one, you know, douchebag being the meditation teacher every gotcha. week. Gotcha. That's a good way of doing it. Gotcha. So about your centers, if I'm not mistaken, don't you have an actual facility that goes in rehab, 28 day inpatient, stuff like that? Unfortunately, it closed. Oh, that closed? three years ago, it, uh, we had to shut it down, but we did, we had detox, we had sober living, we had residential, yeah. the whole thing using this Buddhist model, but unfortunately it closed. I might, might try to get it open again at some point, but like financially, you know, the treatment world is so corrupt yeah. and the insurance billing and all of that stuff and the intention to help people and to provide quality treatment is still there in me and my community. Um, but it's quite a difficult business and it's quite a difficult business to do ethically. I was about to say it's hard. It's probably hard to charge for stuff like that and do it in a way where you don't, you don't feel like you're taking advantage of anyone. Yeah. Cause it's so damn expensive those places. And I'm sure it's just because the cost of it is so high, you know, with our healthcare system and things like that. I mean, I remember I've only been to rehab once. This is my first shot at sobriety. But when I went, I didn't have that money. I remember a guy telling me it's $1,000 a day. 
But randomly, this guy in California goes, call this number, see what's going on. It was a state in New Jersey, something. And the woman said, have you ever had a DUI? And I had one when I was 27. She goes, that qualifies you for us to pay. So they paid for my stay. I didn't pay anything. And so it's the only good thing that ever came with my DUI. You know, it actually, it, it, it finally paid off one day now. But um, so let me ask you this. This is a controversial question. Well, not too controversial, but I've had a lot of disagreements in my, we always talk about this. Do you think addiction is a disease? Um, the hard one. Mostly I want to say, I don't know. Okay. That's and, fair. uh, you know, there's a, according to kind of Western psychology, there is a, a diagnosis for substance abuse disorder. Yeah. Um, and it has been classified uh, as a, you know, kind of disease for advanced levels of alcoholism, where there's an actual uh, change in the structure of the brain, kind of wet brain type of alcoholic, and that that could be classified as a disease. I don't, it doesn't resonate with me that everyone that becomes dependent on drugs or alcohol or addictive behaviors um, is suffering from a disease. Um, it makes sense that in the 1930s or 40s or whenever, they said, hey, let's normalize ourselves as addicts and take out of the kind of religious mor uh, moralistic judgment of a moral failing as addicts and let's classify it as a disease. Mm -hmm. In that way, it's not a disease, but it makes sense that they did that and it probably helped a lot of people and continues to help a lot of people to pretend like they have a disease. Yeah. What it is, is it's an imbalance. And as I was talking about, um, it's craving, it's repetitive craving, it's addictive craving. Now, this is something that everyone has craving. Everyone doesn't have um, the level of craving of the addict who has total disregard for consequences. <laughs> Yeah. Everybody wants everything to be pleasant all of the time. It's Everybody wants thing. all of the pain to go away. Everyone yeah, suffers yeah. from the disease of craving. But not yeah. everybody drinks ourselves into alcoholism or shoots our, you know, smokes crack or shoots yeah. heroin. Or... So I don't use the term disease in refuge recovery. Um, but again, I don't know. You know, I think it's helpful for some people to look at it that way. And I don't have a problem with people looking at it that way. It's not the way I look at it. I look at it as an imbalance and, um, and something that although we can heal and we can recover and we can radically transform the way that we respond to our cravings and aversions and thoughts and feelings. And um, I am of the opinion that we need to maintain abstinence and that there has been something in almost all addicts, not all, but almost all of us, that there's like a, a, almost like an allergy or something about our traumatized nervous system. Okay, I said it, traumatized, right? Uh, and yeah. so it, it does, that, that perspective makes way more sense to me that, you know, the cause of, of it isn't that it's this mysterious disease, that it's the traumatic experiences that we've been through that put our fucking nervous system and our craving out of whack. Yeah. And that no matter how much we recover, that addictive tendency doesn't go away. For a real addict, for a real addict, I don't think it's ever safe to use drink again. That we need to maintain long-term, lifelong abstinence. Um, that's, you know, that, that's been my experience. I've seen so many hundreds of people think that they graduated from abstinence, that they stayed sober long enough that they could go back to normal drinking or using or whatever. And it never turns out very well. It yeah. never turns out very well. Now, I'm not of the opinion that it's impossible for a previous alcoholic or addict to possibly... I'm sure that I'm sure that there's some exceptions to the rule, but the vast majority of people who have experienced addiction will go back to addictive use. Yeah. 
So disease, not disease. I don't really care. And, you know, people that want to argue about it, it's not worth arguing about. You know, like uh, what we know is that there's a solution and the solution is sobriety. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, Because uh, I was going to say, so you're talking about abstinence. Would you consider your father in recovery still or because you said he smokes weed? I don't know if he still does, um, but would you consider that abstinent or how, how do you feel about marijuana? Because a lot of people, like you said, somebody told me the term the other day I never heard. He goes, well, that means you're California sober. And I was like, oh, I got it giggled a little bit. But what's your take on that? Um, my take is that abstinence means total uh, abstinence, renunciation of all recreational mood and mind altering substances. Um, the only, you know, I'll, I'll give three passes and you, you know, if you're smoking weed, you're not in recovery. You're not sober. Okay. Um, if you're drinking, if you're using psychedelics, you're not like, that's not abstinence. If any of it is used recreationally. Um, there's a different conversation here that's happening more and more about medicinal use, you know, mm -hmm. and even marijuana, like, you know, there are certain medical conditions that THC might be the appropriate treatment for. So that's different than recreational. My bottom line for recovery is total abstinence from any kind of recreational use. Gotcha. There's three exceptions in the Buddhist view. Caffeine is a drug that is acceptable. Sugar is a drug that is acceptable, like unless you are a sugar addict or a food addict, and then you maintain abstinence from sugar. And nicotine is considered to be a lower level, uh, you know, stimulant that doesn't, you know, so the Buddhist perspective is, do the substances that you're ingesting recreationally lead to a, a lack of mindfulness? And so the Buddhist view is you can have some caffeine, some sugar, some nicotine and maintain mindfulness. How old is that where you, that's acceptable? Because think about, I, don't, I don't know if the Buddha back then knew about nicotine or caffeine. When do you think that was actually? hundred percent. He hundred percent knew about it because there's oh, he did. Tea, okay. There's tea and coffee, you know. Okay. I didn't think about beginning that. Beginning of time. Um, and there's tobacco, you know, and, you know, at the time of the Buddha, there was a lot of weed smoking, you know. The Buddha was, you know, the, the Shivites in, in Hinduism um, really? are, are like Indian Rastafarians. They smoke yeah. weed as part of their spiritual path. And he said, no, you know, that's not, that's not what we're doing. We're, we're having an, a clear mind. And, you know, you can't be mindful and high at the same time. The thing is, is that when you're high, you feel mindful, but you're not, you're <laughs> deluded. It's, yeah. So the refuge recovery perspective is total abstinence. Now, we could have a conversation about harm reduction. I'm a fan. I think that harm reduction is a good thing for people. That was, to my, do. Next, that was my next question. And yeah. also stuff like safe injection sites for IV users. That's a... I'm all for it. Okay. And I'm all, I'm all for it. And it's not recovery. Harm reduction is a cool thing. It has a place. If people are going to be using, they should still have access to resources, to counseling, to, you know, safe injection sites, all of that stuff. If you're not going to stop, you shouldn't be treated like, you know, you get no resources or help or love until you stop. Yeah. But it's not recovery. Recovery is stopping and staying stopped and healing. And that as soon as we're, from my perspective, as long as people are continuing to get high, they can't really do the healing. They're still avoiding what needs to be healed by self-medicating recreationally or whatever you want to call it. So abstinence and harm reduction for the people who aren't ready, willing to get sober yet. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what you said that definitely there's a difference between recovery and harm reduction. That's definitely, you have to make that distinction. But out but, of compassion, we should still provide, you know, whatever we can provide to everyone who's suffering, whether they're suffering from addiction or, you know, poverty, whatever it is. 
the truth is I was against it at first, but then when I did through my research, learning a little bit more about it, the fact that it lowers hepatitis C, it lowers the transmission of AIDS. And most importantly, it lowers the death rate because yeah. this girl in my group, she's a harm reductionist. And she always says to me, dead people don't recover. Yeah. So when someone said that to me, I was like, okay. And then I also thought about what if it was someone in my family, would I want them to have this access? Because no matter what, they're going to do it. Even if they need to use water from a puddle, I've heard that story. And then they stuck it in their arm. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. I appreciate your take on that. So again, towards the end here, um, one of my questions are, do you have anything to say to the listeners as far as any advice, your words of wisdom, <laughs> anything that you want to personally say? I'll say a couple of things. You know, one of, the core, one of the core things that we're focusing on in refuge recovery is forgiveness. And uh, we encourage people when they start the refuge recovery process to um, practice mindfulness and forgiveness and alternate for, you know, um, and continue to do forgiveness that as addicts, often we have a lot of guilt and shame and self-hatred and yeah. low self-esteem. So self-forgiveness is a core part of our practice. And, and it's not something that's gonna ever happen by itself. Like we were talking earlier about neuroplasticity. Your mind has a tendency to judge and compare and hate. In order to train your mind to forgive, you got to repeat forgiveness intentions, meditations over and over and over to create that neural pathway of forgiveness. And this might take years, but it's never going to happen all by itself. So forgive as a systematic process of training the mind to forgive. Self-forgiveness. Also, probably the biggest thing that people relapse about is resentments towards others. Yeah, and so cool. forgive everyone. Train your mind to have enough compassion for the you know harm that has been caused to you. We forgive for ourselves. It's not you know, like maybe they don't fucking deserve it. They might not. They have their karma from the ways that they've hurt us. But for us to hold on to it, we're putting our life in danger. We're putting our recovery in danger. So forgive everyone eventually well the you buddha know, said practice it, forgiveness yeah go ahead that anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die or there's also the example of picking up a hot coal you're going to get burned before the other person does 100 percent. so and you know so forgive ourselves forgive others and make amends ask for forgiveness, both in your own meditation for all of the ways that you feel guilty about how your addiction, your self-centeredness, your hurt other people, train your mind to ask for forgiveness and, the big and then go out and make direct amends. Yeah. Talk to the people that you've hurt and take responsibility and make amends. Yeah, so that's, that's key. I feel like that is a key on, you know, something that you don't want to miss as part of recovery. And then the last thing I want to say to your listeners and you is come check out Refuge Recovery. Come to a yep. meeting. We've got Zoom meetings every day. So wherever you are, you can tune in, check it out on Zoom. It's a low commitment. You can, you know, kind of, you know, there's that whole voyeuristic thing that's happening yep. with these online meetings. Yep. Um, come check it out. And then maybe in, your, in, in Jersey, there's a bunch of meetings. There's meetings all over the country. It's a little tough right now with the pandemic to know which in-person meetings are happening, which ones aren't. Yeah. But there's there's meetings all over. Come check it out and see if it resonates with you. Where where do they find it? Like you said, come check it out. Is on um, Refuge Recovery the Facebook page, and I'm assuming you guys have a website. Go to the website. Uh, yeah, not the website. Facebook page. Go to the website refugerecovery.org, and then that will be all the links to the in-person and Zoom meetings. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Anything else you want to pitch? Any new books you're working on? Anything like that? I'm working on some books, but nothing to pitch. Just, right. just refuge recovery. Just, you know, like you're, you've got a, an audience of people who are recovering. So check it out and integrate it. And, you know, my feeling with all, as I said, I still go to AA. I go to refuge. You've got your addicts anonymous. We don't need to pick one path and exclude all of them. Exactly. See what works. Check it out. Go to some 12 step, go to some refuge, go to some addicts anonymous, check it out and, and, and find your way and build your community of other recovering addicts that we support each other along the way. 
awesome. Completely awesome. I really want to thank you for doing this today. I think we had a good interview. How do you feel? It was great. Thanks. Happy to be here. All right. So, folks, here's my little pitch. If you like what you heard, go on the bottom right and click subscribe. Also, give us a like. Go to our Facebook page, you know, leave a like and a review. Check out our group. We also have the website, addicts-anonymous.com. We have a blog and all that. We also have the YouTube channel. And we have, we're on Spotify, Anchor, Breaker, and a couple more platforms. So come check us out. And until next time.